Good morning, church family. Good morning. At this time, we'll have a scripture reading. We come from the book of Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 31. And that's the book of Luke, 16th chapter, verses 19 through 31. And the Bible reads, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sword, that he laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham fall and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he might dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear, let him hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, for if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one who rose from the dead. I'm ready to hear you from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Let us all be thankful for the word of God. Okay. Let us pray. God, today we give our power to you. We know that you are in control of everything. And we believe you are willing to help us. Please help us find peace in you. Father, we are in need of your power so we might change and grow. We surrender ourselves to you. Please help us to understand how to be submissive to you that we might be filled with your spirit. Father, continue to bless the leadership here in New York. We ask this blessing in your son's name. Amen. 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 Let the Lord's church say amen. amen. Our God, he is alive. And certainly we recognize that he lives because he lives in us. He enables us and he sustains us in our everyday walks in life. But to acknowledge the sovereignty of God is an awesome thing. To recognize his greatness, his ability, what God is able to do in each one of our lives. God is awesome just being God. 
but with him, when he includes you and I in the midst of everything he created and all that he sustained in this world, all of his love, all of his greatness was given to us or designed rather with us in mind. And that's the greatness of his church. God designed it from the beginning of time that the church that his son died for and established on the day of Pentecost would be the church that he would bless, he would strengthen, recognize, and one day receive up in glory. I'm just glad to be a child of God and a member of God's family this morning. And that's why we can sing about the greatness of God, that we serve a God who is alive. He rose from the dead on the third day to die no more, sits on the right hand of the Father, and he makes intercessions for you and I. We ought to thank God this morning that we have this awesome privilege among ourselves. I thank God for allowing us to be here this morning. As I look out over the audience, I see that Satan did not deter anybody from coming that wanted to come. You see, sometimes he allows even the natural things to hinder us. And many of us probably could have stayed home and said, well, you know, it's too cold and there's patches of ice here and there, but, uh, but you love God more. And so you decided to trust God to bring you here and trust God to take you back. And we appreciate that. We appreciate all of our visitors. I want you to know that you are our honored guest this morning. And we thank God that you chose to worship with us. If there's anything that we can do in way of service to you, let us know. Because that's what we strive to do here at the Newberg Congregation. We are a congregation that love to serve. Love to let people know about God and about the salvation that Jesus provides here. If you have your copies of God's word this morning, I, I want you to look back to the book of Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16. And just before I, I read that text, again, I, I, I'm reminded, and I'm going to make it at the end of the lesson, but I know I'll forget. So I'm going to make that announcement now. I was informed, Brother Clark informed me that uh, Brother Gray, I'm not sure which one, uh, had his car running this morning. Somebody stole his automobile uh, from the lot. So I'm just want to remind you, and I know we try to warm them up before we get in to go home, but you have to be careful about your automobiles, not just because it's the holidays. People don't care what day it is. You have to be careful about what you have and make sure that uh, if you're out there and your car is running, you're out there with your car or standing close uh, to your vehicle. And they say that uh, if your automobile uh, is stolen because you left it running, they may give you a citation. So, so you have to take all of this uh, in consideration uh, when you pull up on the church uh, uh, lot or wherever you are in the mall or maybe on your jobs to be careful about your automobile. Uh, people will uh, break into your uh, car. In Luke chapter number 16, I'm going to read just a few verses from this uh, uh, chapter, beginning at verse 19. There was a certain rich man which were clothed in purple and fine linen and fare sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which were laid at the gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died 
and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may uh, dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from there. I want to use the subject this morning. If heaven has everything you need, then what in hell do you want? If heaven has everything you need, then what in hell do you want? When we talk about scripture and we talk about the word of God, we oftentimes want to emphasize heaven more than we emphasize hell. But when you look at the biblical expression of heaven and hell, you will understand and come to know they are both a place of reality. There's no fiction about heaven and hell. You see, when you think about what God has done through Christ to make certain that we have a right to the tree of life in heaven. And all that God have done through his son to make sure without any doubt that every person who hear the call of Christ, the word of God can make heaven their eternal home. But it seems that no matter what God have done and what God is doing, there are just some folk just, just don't want heaven, they have a reservation with hell. And when you look at the biblical expression, I want you to see, and this is no way everything that's in heaven, because there's some things about heaven we don't know. And we won't know till we get there if God revealed everything to us. And you have to understand that when we get to heaven, that God may not want to talk to us about everything. And we ought to be content just being there with him. Because in my mind, I had always, always thought that when I get there, there's a whole lot of stuff I'm going to ask God. But when I think about it, I really don't have to ask anything. Because everything that made hell on this side of life, it won't be there in heaven. And so when you look at the biblical expression of heaven, we have to understand something. That heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. According to John 14 and verses 1 through 3. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that you may be also. It is a prepared place. When you look at Heaven expression. Revelation chapter 21 
And verses 1 through 4 says, And John write, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says, and John writes, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, crystal as clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of his streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each, uh, 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations, and there should be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is a small biblical expression of heaven. It describes or express everything that you and I will ever need after we cross over on the other side. And I believe that while we are serving God today, that there are so many things and, and things that, that we wish for and, and yearn for that God already have in place. But you cannot get it until you get there. That's what makes heaven heaven. Because God is doing everything. God has everything under control. God is giving us our blessing, our final and eternal blessings in eternity. But then when I look at hell, and the word hell is the Greek word translated from the Hebrew word hell to Gehenna. Hell is a prepared place. Make no mistake about it. Hell is a prepared place for unprepared people. In Matthew 25 and verse number 41. And the Bible said, then he, he will also say to those on the left, depart from me. You are cursed into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. People have have got a serious misconception of hell. And like them, even those of us in the church, our misconception of hell or our lack of urgency about leading people from hell has made us apathetic toward the destiny of the lost and has made the lost ignorant of their eternal destiny. People say, I sure hope I don't go to hell when I die. Yet they live like they can't wait to get there. Or they might say, I don't want to go to hell when I die. But they don't do anything to prevent it while they're still living. So in this lesson, 
I want to provide some illumination about a very dark place called hell. Hell is not a place to expire, but a place to flee from. When you look at the biblical expression of hell, don't y'all get scared. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. But when you look at some biblical expression which describe the horrors of hell, hell is called a lake of fire, a place of everlasting destruction, a horrible tempest, a place of weeping and wailing, a bottomless pit, a place of, of torment, a devouring fire, a place of outer darkness, a place of sorrow, a place where men will have no rest, a place of no hope, a place where the fire is unquenchable, a place where the worms and maggots never die. Hell is a place of conscious, unending suffering. It is totally different from heaven. And if heaven has all that you need, then what in hell? Do you want? With these graphic descriptions of hell, it should let us know that hell is a reality and a terrible place to spend eternity. This life, listen, in this life, this life gives each of us an opportunity to make our reservation in heaven so that would not be given that we would not be given an accommodation in hell. Now, now understand what I'm saying. Now, if, if you miss heaven, there's no neutral place. If you miss heaven, you're going to hell. And somebody will have the nerve to say, well, 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 well you know how we say sometimes we get mad at folk. I die and go to hell. No, you just die. Outside of Christ, you don't worry about you going to hell. God will send us to hell. Don't think God is playing. So when I look at this lesson, and I know I probably won't finish it this morning, but there are about four things of hell that we need to know. We need to know the characteristics of hell, the occupants of hell, the misconception of hell and the detour from hell. And I believe once we understand these four principles or these four facts, I believe we'll have a better appreciation for what Christ did for us at Calvary, that he died to deliver us. He died to make sure that nobody go to hell but the devil and his angels and not us. When you look at the characteristics of hell, you remember I said the Hebrew word for hell, uh, the Hebrew word is hell. Uh, but when you translate the word hell uh, uh, with the Greek word, it, it comes to Gehenna. And Gehenna is something that the people of Jesus' day understood. When Jesus used this word, yeah. hell, and usually when Jesus speaks of hell, he used this term always, Gehenna, which means the valley of Hinnom, or Hinnom, Hinnom. Apparently, the valley of Hinnom was used, and let me tell you what, 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 what it means first. When he talked about Gehenna and the valley of Hinnom, Hinnom or the valley of the sons of Hinnom, it was used as the garbage dump for the city of Jerusalem where they cast their refuse, waste material. Dead animals were burned there as well. Fire continually smothered and smoke from the burning debris. It rose day and night. Hinnon thus became a graphic symbol of woe and judgment 
and the place of eternal punishment called hell. When you look at this word hell, that's translated to Gehenna, it is used 12 times in the New Testament, 11 times by Jesus, and one time by James. In Mark, Matthew 5, 22, Mark 9, 43, 45, and 47, Luke 12, verse 5, James 3, and verse number 6. So when Jesus used this word, this term, people understood what he was referring to because it was a place where everybody went in Jerusalem. Gehenna was the city dump. Now, now here in Louisville, we have a city dump or, or a county dump. All of the waste material, all of our trash, all of our garbage goes right out here by the airport. Is, is, that, is that right? Come on, y'all act like you don't know where it go at. Uh, you can see it from the expressway. And it's called the dump. Like Gehenna, hell is the eternal dumping ground for refused souls. A holding place for the lost until the judgment day of Christ. It was created for the devil and his angel. And then further characteristics of hell, understand that hell is hot. Now, I see y'all with some fans this morning. But let me tell you something. You don't know what hot is. The stuff we go through in this life cannot compare to the hotness of hell. Gehenna was the place where everybody took the trash. The dead carcasses of all kinds was there because it was the area for refuse. There were perpetual or continuous fires that burned day and night, all day and every night. People could take their trash there and throw it into the pit, into the valley where eternal fires continue to burn. And so you see the scene, it's a hot place. The fire is never quenched. They have people there to make sure that the fire never is quenched. Hell is eternal. The continual, continual burning of the refuse was a perfect description of the continual fires of hell. When Jesus told them that the fire is not quenched, Jews understood what he, what he meant. Because the fires of Gehenna never went out. There were people who saw to that. They made sure that everybody trash, their waste, their refuse, their dead animals, everything was cast there, but the fire continued. It never went out. It burned every day, all night, forever. They would burn up everything. And therefore, people could take their trash any time of the day or any time of the night. Hell is a place of misery and pain. As in the case of our text of the rich man, people in hell would be in torment or agony. There would be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, when you look at the text now, the Bible said this rich man in hell, he lifted up his eyes. And he said being in tormented. And he saw Lazarus fall off in Abraham's bosom. And he began to cry out to Abraham, Send Father Abraham, send Lazarus to me. Let him dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. This flame wasn't going out. And you know, Abraham responds, Lazarus can't come to you and you can't come to Lazarus. There's a gulf fix. And that gulf is, that's a separation. 
that the people in Gehenna and the people in paradise, they can't leave. It's a fixed place. And you have to stay where you are. Hell is dark in contrast to paradise. It is a place of darkness because the Bible says in Revelation, there is no light there. Jesus said that the lost would be cast out into outer darkness. Though there are flames there, there would be no light in hell. And the reason we see flames now is because of the oxygen in the environment. But there is no oxygen in hell. Therefore, there is no light in hell. Hell is a place for the gone and the forgotten. Just as people don't think about the trash they throw away, they will also forget about those who language in hell. Revelation 21 and verse number four says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There should be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Now, all of that remembrance won't be in heaven. Y'all look at me now. Folk talking about they're going to get up there and look back at other folk. No, no, all of that's gone. It's forgotten and remembered no more. That's why the Bible said there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow, no more tears in heaven. Because the thing that created all of that would be no more. You won't have any memory. And I believe those tears will go to the memory of every person who has ever lived that didn't make it to heaven. I know I heard folks say how they would feel when they get to heaven and see the loved ones in hell. No, you won't. All of that's forgotten. God is creating a new environment. God has given us something new. But hell is a place of eternal torments, eternal fire, no hope, no escape, no deliverance, eternal regrets, eternal loneliness, eternal separation from God and the saints, and eternally forgotten. You, you know, the Bible teaches, have, have you, uh, and I may not get this right now, uh, 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 the way I want to say it, but you know the Bible said uh, we live our days as a tale that's been told. And you know what? After a while, some of the memories we had of folk, they just fade away. Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes you've forgotten about the person. I didn't say you didn't love them, but the memory there just keep fading and fading and fading. It can be a close loved one, but after a period of time, and I'm not saying how much time, but the memory just fade away unless there's something striking that brings out mine. I'm talking on this side, brings out mine back to that. The second point, my second point, the occupants of hell. Uh-huh, you get ready. Because <clears throat> mm -hmm. everybody that's walking up and down 18th Street and Broadway ain't the only folk going to go to hell. And I would dare to say maybe some of them may not go, some of them may not be what you think they are. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. He says, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who finds it. In this particular verse, 
Jesus gives us the indication that hell will be a religious place. And I'm going to prove that to you. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Are y'all looking funny? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus is here implying that that hell would be filled to record-breaking capacity with religious people. Because he's saying right here, not everyone that called me Lord, Lord. Uh Uh-huh. I know some of us say how much we love Jesus on Sunday morning. Then we talk about how much we love Jerry Springle on Mondays. Jesus said, not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, should enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. He said, many are going to say to me what they did in my name. Some said they prophesied in Jesus' name. They preached in his name. Some say, we, 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 we have cast out devils in your name. Some say, we, we have done many wonderful works in your name. You know, just like us doing a whole lot of stuff for Jesus, or we say for Jesus. A whole lot of stuff for the church that has no heart, that has no feeling in it. In other words, we talk to talk, but we didn't walk the walk. And Jesus said a lot of folk going to say that. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Jesus said, I'm going to say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. People, or hell will be filled with, to capacity, with religious people. People who were religious, but not saved. People who were religious, who had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. People who were religious, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. People who were religious but would not practice what they were preaching and teaching. People who were religious but would not but would not allow the live rather holy and sanctified lives. People who were religious but would not love one another. People who were religious but would kill others with their tongue. People who were religious but would not forgive other folk. People who were religious but would never say I'm sorry or repented of their sin. People who were religious, who uh, uh, people who were religious but would test a lie before they testify. I- I'm talking about religious folk here. Never glorify God. They would test a lie in church before they testify of the goodness of God. In their life, there will be many people in hell and they will fall into many categories. But most of them who would be there would be sinners who denied their faith and trust in Christ. You hear a lot of us talk about how much we go to church. You got to do more than go to church. Oh, how much I read my Bible. You got to do more than read your Bible. I'm all right about it. You, you see, the devil come to church. The devil quote the scripture. So we're not doing any more than what he does. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? We have to be a servant of Christ. We have to be converted unto Jesus. Jesus has to be the master of our life. 
He has to control our eternal destination. We cannot be on Christ today and on Seder tomorrow. You got to make your stay because you can't serve two masters. You got to love one and hate the other. Uh huh. Or cling to one and let the other go. You got to do one or the other. But you have to understand there's no neutral ground with God. And what make it hell, in my opinion, I can't give you a, a biblical text or scripture, but what make hell, hell, in my opinion, is to think about all the stuff you could have done. Did you not hear the text? When, when this rich man, now understand now, the Bible said Lazarus died and was carried by the angel Abraham's bosom. But the rich man died too. And God not showing in favor to him about death. They both died. But what the Bible said, Abraham, uh, Lazarus was carried by, by the angel to Abraham's bosom, but the rich man who died and was buried showed that he had a funeral, but in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And let me show you why I say memory is hell. Watch what the Bible say. And, and I close it out and finish it up tonight. Listen what, what the Bible say. When he cried out to Father Abraham in verse number four, 24, he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember. Uh-huh. That's the word. Abraham brought his mind back. Now, remember in your day how you enjoy life. I want you to think about it. Uh-huh. You think about what you could have done. Remember when you had opportunity to help poor Lazarus out. Remember that, that you, you, you fare something else every day. In other words, you live a life of luxury. There were folk all around you that were suffering and struggling. But son, now remember when you had an opportunity. A lot of us are going to have a whole lot of remembering. Uh-huh. About what you could have done that you didn't do. That's what make hell hell, ain't it? Uh-huh. Get down there, you know, and you ain't going to have the notepad now. You might well put it up right now. <laughs> You're not going to Google anything from hell. Because the rich man tried it. Isn't that right? He tried to do a whole lot of stuff from hell that he didn't do while he was living. Y'all help me out. Abraham says, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Lord, help us. Lazarus is comforted in Abraham's bosom. And now you are tormented. And a few verses up, the rich man was comforted. And Lazarus was in torment from hunger. But look, I switched around. Lazarus wanted something you had, and now you want something Lazarus has. Are y'all hear what I'm saying? The Bible's clear. And then he said now, and I'm closing, he said, beside all of this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed 
so that they which would pass from hence, from here to you, cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from you. Then he said, he's still talking, the rich man, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send it him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come to this place or torment. Here in hell and trying to do some evangelistic work. <laughs> he could have had an effect on his brothers while he was living. You see, now he's remembering some stuff. Isn't that right? I, 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 he remember now, you know, I, I got five brothers. They just like me. And, and if somebody don't help them, they're going to be down here with me. He's remembering everything. Am I right about it? He, he said, now, now, he said, I got five brothers. Send last, let him talk to them. Because they on their way down here. You see, memory can be hell. When you had an opportunity to do something that you know you didn't. And we sear our conscience to keep us from doing it. Then Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now, you know, there are folk in our world today has an opportunity to hear the word of God. The gospel is being preached. That's a church in every neighborhood. But some of them just refuse to hear. And so he said to the rich man, he said, they got Moses. They had Moses and the prophets, why don't you go ahead and listen to them? Right. He wasn't talking about Moses in person. Yeah. He was talking about the Ten Commandments, the old law. Yeah. Why didn't he listen to the law? Yeah. You had an opportunity to listen and study the law. They talked about Christ. Yeah. They pointed you to Christ. Yeah. But he said, no, Father Abraham. He said, but if you send somebody back from the dead, he said, they're here. You see our folk heals. You, you send somebody who done died, back people listen to them. And Jesus told him, uh, Abraham told him, you know, he said now, no, they didn't hear Moses and the prophets. They won't hear even though one rose from the dead and they still didn't listen. So why should somebody else from the dead go back? If what Jesus did at the cross and in the tomb, if that don't change your thinking, nothing else is going to change your thinking. There are some folk who just not go undo their thinking. We need to admit that. And don't get mad when folk don't listen to you. When you try to help them to understand the word of God, that they might be saved. Don't get mad and talk about you, you are not eloquent enough to teach the word of God. You may be more than eloquent. But just some folk don't want to listen. But that memory is hell. Huh? Now y'all may well fess up to it. Because you have some memories. You ain't down in Gahina yet. But, but, but we have some memory stuff we wish we had done. I think of a whole lot of stuff I wish I had done better. 
that I'm suffering for right now. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. You see, because some of y'all act like you're a straight A Christian. <laughs> like you ain't never flunked on anything. <clears throat> you see, I, I wouldn't know how well I was doing in the Christian education with Christ had I not flunked in some courses. <clears throat> and because I did flunk, not willingly, but sometimes ignorantly and unknowing. But I flunked. But you know, I got a tutor. Did y'all hear what I said? I said, I got me a tutor to help me to come to the knowledge of Christ. And that's the word of God. You know why I was flunking? I was listening to myself and to other folk. So I got me a private tutor. And that's the word of God who helped me. Second Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. They are profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect or complete in every way. That's why my tutor worked for me, and it's still working. I flunk every day and then now. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Flunk. But I'm so glad that God gave me a tutor to help me to make it through. If heaven has everything you need, what in hell do you want? We got two more points left. But I'm just asking a question. Because if heaven really in your heart, in your mind, has everything you really need, then what is it in hell that you want? Because there got to be something. The way some of us live, the way we do things, the way we live our life, the way we act, out in public, there must be something down there. There got to be something that you really want in hell. But you know, some of the things people say about hell, hell, when everybody get there, we're going to party, party, harder, harder with old friends. <laughs> no, you're not. Hell's not a place of partying. All torment. Did you hear what I'm saying? And you're not going to have it ease because everybody else is down there with you. Everybody down there with you is going to be just like you. It's going to be burning. And the fire is never quenched. What in hell do you want? And if there's nothing in hell you want, then you ought to look to the heavens who have everything that you need. You heard the word of God this morning. Once you make up in your mind that you want to go to heaven. As I've said, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. You have to prepare your life to go to heaven. There's no crash courses that you take to get to heaven. And you'll find out tonight, you know, there's no other way to heaven but one way. But there are people who still are trying to find another way to heaven. Trust God this morning. Believe his word. Repent of your sin. Make up in your mind that there's nothing down there you need. Because if I had time to tell you, if you're holding grudge and harboring evil against your neighbor, I can tell you where you're on your way to. And that's not judging. You're going to have to let it go. Because if there's something so bad in life about a person that they can hold that kind of power over you that you won't let it go, you'd rather have your reservation in hell than to say I'm through with it. 
I'm, I'm, I'm through with it. I'm going to do the right thing. If I need to repent, I'll do it. Confess, I'll do it. But whatever it takes, I'm not going to let it send me to hell. And you've heard people in your Bible classes and everywhere else talking about, before I forgive that person, I'm going to die and go to hell first. No, you just die. You just die. You ain't got to go. God going to send you. So if you're here and you trust Christ to be the Savior of the world, the Son of God, then confess your faith in him to be God's son. Just by saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then be baptized in baptism for the remission of sin. God will wash away your past sin. God will present you as a newborn babe in Jesus Christ. Add you to the body of Christ. God will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Change the status of your relationship from a sinner to a child of God. And if you're faithful on into death, he will give you a crown of life that fadeth not away. So if you're here this morning and you know the rewards of heaven and you know what awaits you if we are faithfully serving God and everything that you need is in God's hand, then my question again, what in hell do you want that is so attractive, so worthy, that it calls you to detour from heaven to hell? If you hear your member of the church, if you need to repent, need to confess, don't let anybody stop you from going to heaven. Don't let anybody get closer to, to God than you because if they're stopping you then they are more closer to God than you are. So make up in your mind. You're going to do the right thing because now you know something. You know hell is real. Hell is not no, no myth. It's not something to be taken lightly. The devil is real. Hell is real. The flames are real. The eternal punishment is real. So now you know that. Why not this morning? Make a change in life. If you don't need to change anything, you're okay. But if you need to change something, do it right now. Together we stand and together we sing.